episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website, and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, quote, The art of war is vital to the state, a road either to safety or to ruin, end quote. So begins one of the great works of strategy, in particular military strategy, written two and a half thousand years ago in China. According to legend, the author of The Art of War was Sun Tzu, reputedly a general or advisor for the King of Wu in the 6th century BC, near the start of 300 years of war that ended with the first emperor, he of the Terracotta army fame. The work was embellished for another thousand years and studied not so much for the directions it gave, but for the state of mind it encouraged, and it influenced leaders from the American Civil War to Mao's Long March to the latest war in Iraq, especially the line, all warfare is based on deception. With me to discuss Sun Tzu and the art of war are Tim Barrett, Professor Emeritus of East Asian History at SOAS, University of London, Hilda de Viet, Professor of Chinese History at Leiden University, and Imre Galambos, Reader in Chinese Studies at the University of Cambridge. Hilda de Viet, whatever its origins, we may get to the point that the art of war emerged when China was in upheaval, 5th century BC. Why was that upheaval and what was it about? Well, the time period during which uh, Sun Wu Sun Zi, uh, was active is called the period of the warring states, so the 6th and the 5th century BCE. And it was a time of tremendous changes, uh, not only military changes, but uh, also social, political and, and cultural changes that in part came as a result of very significant military changes. To understand them, perhaps we have to backtrack a little bit to the period before then, the centuries immediately uh, before Sun Wu was alive. When uh, the Zhou dynasty, the dynasty that ruled most of the Chinese territories uh, during uh, Sun Tzu's lifetime, set up their dynasty, they ruled it as a system that is equivalent to a a feudal system, the the way we know it from uh, medieval European history. They parceled out the land, gave it to members of their own clan. Uh, There were disagreements from time to time, but those were usually settled through small-scale warfare. Uh, that was uh, done by the aristocrats themselves, by members of the imperial family, as well as uh, their entourage. Uh, They did that uh, on chariots, bronze, um, with bronze weapons. Uh, It was fairly a small-scale affair, and it was also done by means of an honor code. Uh, Warfare wasn't uh, it wasn't international, it wasn't killing everybody. But by the 6th and 5th century, the Zhou dynasty had lost their control, more or less. They had lost their capital, uh, some of the states had lost their connection with the Zhou ruling house, and that meant that uh, a new leadership came to the fore, a leadership that wanted to strengthen their state through a variety of means. But one of the means by which they did that was to develop large-scale infantry Uh, armies, armies of conscripts. And those armies fought with iron weapons, iron weapons that could be more easily manufactured, that were were cheaper to manufacture, uh, but that were also more deadly. As a result of that, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers came into the field. Just a second, you say hundreds of thousands, sorry Mm -hmm. to interrupt, you say hundreds, you actually literally have evidence that there were hundreds of thousands. Yes, that's what the numbers give us. Some of these may be exaggerated, but it does look that that's uh, that's the scale. And uh, particularly, uh, these are numbers that are not mentioned for one or two of the states. There are several states that were able to field armies that large. The population was increasing as a result of uh, economic changes. Uh, Taxation was heavy, which meant that uh, the state could also afford to have these uh, larger armies. So, in a sense what you're saying, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, that the change in the nature of warfare not only influenced warfare, but influenced the shaping of society. Uh, And that now we have cavalry and infantrymen and not just the aristocrats in their bronze chariots. We have iron instead of bronze, as it were. Indeed. And and it brought forward a new sort of person, not the aristocrats, but let's call them the experts. Indeed. So you have large-scale armies of conscripts that were led by new leaders, uh, military experts that were recruited not necessarily because they were members of the aristocracy, but because they had shown special expertise uh, and effectiveness in waging battles and winning victories. What? How did he fit into this, Sun Tzu? We, let's come to him right away. 
he is one of these persons, but I'm asking you first before I go, <laughs> if you don't mind finishing this off. So he is one of these persons, I presume there are a lot of them. Where did he get his training to go south to this newer kingdom or, and, and, and get employed down there? It's very difficult to know exactly what his what his training was because we have very little biographical information about Sun Wu himself. But he was part of a larger group of military experts who partially were on the in the field. Uh, he, he grew up in Wu, a, a state that had conf a conflict with uh, Chu, another state. Uh, most likely, he may have been involved in in that kind of a conflict. Uh, but he was ma mainly known as someone who theorized about war, who fought about war, not necessarily as a general who was trained in the field, uh, not somebody who was known for his military prowess or his martial qualities, but more as somebody who fought about strategy. You were talking about he was generally thought of as much. We come to the real question, Tim, Tim Barrett. Yes. What do we really know about him? Very little. There's a terrific story, but it we'll may... We'll come to the story in a minute. It's okay. the only one we've got. It's the only one we've <laughs> so got. So we'll sort of okay. pace it. <laughs> okay, well, okay. Uh, I won't rush to the story, uh, but uh, I'll lead up to it by saying that he seems to have been a man from the heartland of China, but from the eastern side. It was a... Uh, one of the key areas in the Chinese world of the time, but that he made his reputation in the state of Wu. Now, the state of Wu is um, sort of Shanghai area today. Now it's obviously part of the heartland of China, but in those days it was a long way from where the heartland had always been up to this point, which is on the North China Plain. This is the Yang Lower Yangtze Valley. This is not quite Chinese in some ways. There are probably a substantial population who don't speak Chinese at this point. It's maybe somewhere more like Southeast Asia in, in terms of culture than what we think of as China. But... It's a place that was up and coming. The ruling elite was in contact with the Chinese world, and they want to make their mark there. And the way to make their mark in this increasingly violent age was through conquest. We're talking about the time which grows to be the time of the Warring States. Yes, it's and moving this is one towards of the Warring the wa States. It becomes one of the Warring States. So he's yes. he's around. We don't know, where, but he's around, <laughs> and he's hired. He's hired by an emperor, and he's hired as a man to look after the military. Yes. And this is the case, the only certain thing we know about him, if it is true. If it is true, <laughs> <laughs> well, let us tell us. Can, okay. you, can you give the listeners? some some yes. slender certainty yes. which might be true. Slender certainty that might be true is that he shows up in the kingdom of Wu and the king of Wu at that time, who is a historical character for sure, says, can you show me what you can do? And he says, I'm happy to help. And uh, yeah, this, of course. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so the, the king says, well, Right here in my palace, I've got a large number of concubines. Uh, could you perhaps demonstrate your skills by uh, uh, putting my concubines through some manoeuvres? And uh, Sunza says, of course. Uh, and But you have to understand that a general has to have absolute powers of command uh, and that... Uh, when I'm in charge, I'm in charge, uh, as the king says, fine. So Sun Tzu splits them into two squads um, of 79 concubines plus one concubine in charge. And, of course, he puts the king's favourites in charge. How could he not? Uh, and then he says to the concubines, or uh, do you know how to face straight ahead, to turn to the left, to turn to the right, to turn to the rear? And they say, yes, we do. Uh, all right, then he explains on what commands he wishes them to make uh, the relevant moves. And uh, apparently it's the signal from a drum or something like that. We know that drums were often used for this purpose. Uh, he uh, has got the two concubines in charge of the two squads, and he says, right, tell your troops, eyes right, or whatever, and the drum is sounded and the concubines fall about laughing. Uh, so he says, um, hmm, well, uh, if this sort of thing happens, maybe it's the general's fault. So he explains everything very carefully again, you know, right, left, straight ahead, uh, etc. Um, and uh, 
they try it one more time and the concubines fall about laughing. He says, well, the general made things clear. It must be due to the officers. And he has stationed a couple of guys with axes uh, just to the uh, on the sidelines of the parade. And he hands the two concubines over for execution. The, the, the king is watching this from a reviewing platform. He immediately sends a, uh, a messenger down and says... Um, Without these ladies, I would have no fun in my life. Please stop. And Sunza sends a message back saying, I said, when the general is in charge, the general is in charge. Uh, more or less. And uh, then he uh, has the concubines. So we're now down to two squads of 78 concubines and two deputy uh, favourites in charge. And it all goes swimmingly. Now, briefly. Yes. <laughs> no, seriously now. But yes. What, that, that, that persists, persists, persists. What do we learn from that? That's interesting, um, because we, we certainly learn a thing or two about military discipline. Yeah, that's one thing. We learn the general is really in charge, yes. the king has got to give it all up. That's yes. the first thing. Secondly, what about that the, is it the idea that anybody can be a soldier if they're well organised? That is perhaps implicit as well, because... Um, one theme that is absolutely consistent in, in Sunza's own writings, uh, whoever invented this story, is the thought that, yes, we don't want heroes uh, to be, as in an age of aristocracy, uh, showing up in chariots and, and displaying their valour. What we want is for every soldier to be at the highest level of heroism we can get them to and to be coordinated in that role. And thirdly, to follow a plan, my plan, which then turns into yeah. this great book, which is being going over two and a half thousand years. And what are the origins of that book, Imre Galambos? Well, the book as we have it today actually goes back to about probably the Song Dynasty, that form, uh, which would be around the 11th century, probably. But the book obviously was written much earlier. And according to the tradition, it was written by this person called Master Sun, or Sun Wu, around 500, probably, BC. But it's very hard to know what the book looked like at that point, or whether, whether the book was actually in existence at that time. So there's different scholarly opinions. So it, might been, it might have been orally transmitted. It could have been orally transmitted. <coughs> it could have been put together not by Master Sun, but by his disciples or the disciples of the disciples. Perhaps even there's a theory that it was put together by a descendant of him about 200 years later. We do have some Han Dynasty, so 1st century BC, uh, 2nd century BC manuscripts with the, uh, the art of war. And these manuscripts uh, contain about one third of the current text. And they show actually that these 13 chapter version that we have today the transmitted version was probably already in existence back then in the second century bc so, so by and large it's not it's not exaggerating for us to say to continue to say as we did at the start of the program as you do in your that it started in about the fifth century bc it was oral then in the second or third century it was written down and and transmitted and transmitted and transmitted after that that's that's more or less right is it well it's possible that it's right. Is I mean, it more we don't know for is sure. It is, what it is it more possible than it's right than anything else is possible that it's right? No, what we know for sure is that around the second century BC, we already have the book. But the manuscript that we find actually has many other components that are not in the current book. So it's actually very hard to coordinate the two versions. But before the second century BC, I mean, textually, we don't have any evidence. We only have the tradition. And this tradition is, in many cases, was proven right by discoveries. There were many doubts about it over the centuries, not only about this book, but many other books. And sometimes these archaeological discoveries show that the tradition is actually right and the doubters were wrong. Can we stay with that? It yeah. It helps the program an awful lot. <laughs> Just for the moment, if we okay. can stay. Now, can you give us a broad 
pricey. Uh, this is the art of war. It's it's not ten commandments. It's about 110, 210 commandments. Uh, uh, just broadly say what he sets out to do, very broadly, and I'm afraid a little briefly. There you go. Well, it's it consists basically of 13 chapters. This is the structure of the book. But in terms of the chapters, it seems that the the teachings or the commandments, as you call them, are actually not very well organized or not very strictly organized into chapters. So they seem to be, in some cases, quite unrelated to each other. So it's more like a collection of different commandments or different teachings. What sort of commandments? What's the drive? Well, it's about how to wage warfare, how to behave, how to win. But these uh, teachings are actually more about not very practical and not very hands-on teachings about uh, what to do in concrete situations, but more about how to think about certain uh, situations. So when you actually come to a new, a completely undocumented situation, you will know how to behave in that position. It does bring in an awful lot, doesn't it? It brings in uh, the idea that uh, there are only five notes, he says, in, in music, and look at the number of uh, melodies it can make, there are only five colours, look at the different combinations we can make. We have only a limited number of things we can do in the battlefield, but look how many things we can do with it. There's that, we can call it a poetic element, a leap element, and he, he, he it, whatever the collective is or him, covers a great, uh, covers a great deal there. Um, how how far did this, the art of war, um, fit in with the other great schools of thought going on at the time, Confucianism, Taoism, Moism, and so on? There are all these schools going on. It's very exciting, isn't it? And it's exciting that it's about the same time as what's something reasonably similar, not this same as going on in Greece, but let's forget about that for a moment. <laughs> how does it fit in with that? What's going on in China that, that m makes them want to regulate and classify in this thorough way? Mm -hmm. So well, the, the warfare that is ongoing and that is uh, quite visible across the Chinese territories also prompts responses to the question of how can we bring order, how can we restore peace, and what are the best ways of bringing about order. And in, in some ways we could say that even though there are these different schools, they share that same agenda, but they have different answers to the question as to how order should be brought about. They also tend to agree that order is probably best brought about by having a monarchical kind of system, by having one leader who then implements uh, answers to uh, the problems of the time. Now, the uh, Sun Wu, if we, if we go with him, there are many other military strategists at the time, but if, if we stay with him, 6th, 5th century, uh, there are quite a few contemporaries around the Confucians, uh, quite well known, the Mohist, slightly less well known, I'll say something about them, and also uh, Taoist thinking uh, is around. He tends to agree on certain aspects. He thinks moral virtues are important. He thinks uh, warfare is a last resort, so he's not an advocate of warfare. It's quite important. In a sense, he's saying the, the best thing to do is not have a war. Exactly. Um, and, and so Confucians would, would also agree with that. The Taoists would definitely agree with it because they think warfare is violence, it's artifice, it takes people away from their natural course. Uh, Confucians think that warfare should be unnecessary because if you're a moral leader, your own population will follow you, but external uh, states will also bring uh, tribute to you. Mohists were willing to wage warfare, but they were also pacifists. So they were only willing to help those who were losing. Sun Wu was different from them in the, in the sense that he thought role, uh, the war had a role to play in bringing about order. He thought differently about the role, but also the nature of war. But is there any one key? I mean, obviously, this is very much a second-rate question, but still, is there is there one key that unlocks this sudden surge of classification across various areas of life that came at that time in China? Is there an intellectual elite? Is there what's going on? Well, they look at these experts. Well, we, we we call them military experts. Actually, they wouldn't have called them necessarily military right. experts. They were advisors, and you have competing states, competing. Uh, heads of state who are looking for people who can help them win against their enemies or at least survive. And for Sun Wu, war is also a way to keep a state alive. Not only defending yourself, but also aggressive warfare. Sometimes it's better to strike out, to be the first to, to make an aggressive move. And moreover, 
for Swinburne, it's also admissible to use any means possible. Once you decide to go to war, it's important to win a victory as fast as possible, and by any have, means. And you'll have dead fields, will you? Go, in, go into this battle and you, and you will all come out dead, and that's okay, that's the way it goes. Yes, morality is far less a concern for him than for any of the others we, uh, we know of at the time. Tim Barrett, we picked out deception in deception yeah. warfare as an earlier thing. Um, he, is this you, what you said at the beginning? The aristocratic society is breaking us. It's very simplistic. Yes. But there seems to be, you said it, so there's got to be some truth in it. Um, is, and they're trying to reform a society through intellect and merit, really. Yes. Is something in that? Fair enough, yes. Well, I'm uh, asking you to develop that, please. Yes. Well, that comes back to the whole rejection of the aristocratic way of conducting warfare which was uh, had a certain sense of fair play these are the uh, sort of iliad sort of thing where where um well Ili the iliad also has of course the trojan horse so deception was not unknown in the west uh, but um the hero likes to be seen to having a, a reasonably fair fight with the other hero um, and uh, that's the way to emphasize his valor and so forth Sun is not interested in that at all he's interested in winning and he tells you that the way to win is by keeping your enemy disconcerted um, uh, deception of course is important but also uh, wrong footing him in every way possible um, uh, one of his key strategic concepts is the direct and the indirect that uh, you you head towards the enemy making him think that you're coming straight at him then you hit him from another direction entirely uh, with a surprise attack and and that as it were becomes one of his guiding principles the the uh his whole approach to warfare is keep the enemy guessing outthink him um use whatever means are possible spies sowing dissension um Wonderful trickery, like pretending you'd got 30,000 men when you'd got 100,000 men. Yes, uh, in fact, um, or, or, or the other way around, but certainly not knowing the en letting the enemy know how many men there are confronting him. One of the translators of the Sunza pointed out that the Chinese People's Liberation Army in the Korean War managed to get a quarter of a million men into Korea before the United Nations troops realised they were there. And that will be kind. Have they been reading this book? <laughs> <laughs> they sh well, certainly the United Nations commanders should have been reading. But on the other <laughs> hand, MacArthur's attack on Incheon, for example, is a classic kind of Sun Tzu move, where uh, the United Nations troops have been bottled up in the south, and then MacArthur simply invaded. Uh, the north as it were with an amphibious landing coming in from the side and then catching uh, the North Korean armies by surprise that way it's the same kind of surprise Can as I just stop you for yes. a MacArthur, was he one of the American generals who did read the art of war? I'm not sure if he did but some certainly of them, some of them did have it in their pocket including yes. for the Iraq war well I'm not specifically sure if MacArthur had read it or not but by the um by the time of the Second World War, um, some Western um, uh, military thinkers were certainly paying attention to Sun Tzu. I mean, the translator I, I, I just mentioned as, as uh, referring to the Korean War was an American general called Sam Griffiths, and he has a preface to his work by Basil Little Hart, who was uh, a fairly well-known strategist, uh, British, uh, of the 1930s, for example. Uh, so it, uh, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but certainly... Um, you can't discount the influence of Sun Tzu in uh, Western tactical thinking by this point. Can we, um, Emery, can we talk about the relationship imagined between the general and others? Um, we know from the concubines the general uh, wanted to have total authority, and that is consistent throughout the uh, throughout the, um, the the rules of war that he, he puts forward. Uh, and also, 
The second thing is that he keeps saying, if you do this, you will win, despite the fact that they are more, they are more numerous than you are. And you will win if you divide the army into seven, if you do this into five, if you take care of the what's coming from the earth and, the, and so on. He's very, that's the idea that you're going to win if you do what he says. Yes, well, the general, first, uh, when you look at the relationship of the general with the ruler and with uh, his subordinates, one of the things that strikes us immediately that when his relationship with the ruler is something that he can cut it, cut it off once he's in charge, he becomes in charge. But interestingly, uh, in the concubine story as well, that in the first time the concubines, concubines giggled and did not follow his orders, um, he did not execute the general. It's only the second time when he executed the smaller command uh, commanders. So the general has some sort of inculpability in the Sun Tzu. He's not... Um, it doesn't seem to be that he, he has a direct sort of subordinate relationship with the ruler. So once he's put in charge, he becomes sort of the top person, and the, even the ruler cannot touch him. When you look downwards, it seems that the... Uh, my impression is definitely that uh, the people under him, he does not look at them as people. It's They are assets to him. The soldiers are assets, and also the people of the country are assets. So he's concerned about, when he talks about the economic um, background of warfare, he's concerned about the people. But he's not concerned about the people of the other state. So his concern for the people is only as assets, as somebody who's providing for the warfare. For the soldiers, it's the same way. He likes his soldiers, but he likes them as, as a tool, as something that he has and he can command with. But uh, within that relationship, it's obvious that his position is extremely important and he does not tolerate any insubordination. We have... I mentioned, or some, one of you mentioned, doesn't really matter, that <coughs> he was talking about a state of mind as much as a as a as a, as a way of strategy, wasn't he? In any way, you can summarise how he's uh, getting that state of mind across, Hilda. Yes, well, I would actually follow up on something that Imre just said, and that he he said that the the general, in some ways, is actually a, a model for the ruler himself. And he's a model for the ruler himself because of the way he thinks. He analyzes situations and he analyzes each situation individually in order to come up with the best response to whatever threat might present itself. And that's the important, I would say, probably the key feature of the general, that it's, it's somebody who has an open mind, so that, that mind cultivation is there, but it's somebody who's attentive to all sorts of factors that could have an impact on whether or not he's going to be successful in the in the move that he wants to make. And t being attentive to everything really means everything, not just and the people, the soldiers I have, but the terrain, the climate, um, anything. And, and constantly, the situation is constantly changing. So it's, it's situational thinking that takes seriously the fact that you cannot take anything for granted at any point because the situation is also constantly evolving yours as well as those of your uh, potential uh, enemies. Yes, when you say climate, you said if you if birds are clustering down there on the left, that means there's some soldiers hiding in the woods, and that's the least of it. But he, he goes in great detail in in, in all those things. And it, there's yeah. an, an interesting story there as well. You were talking mm -hmm. about Western strategists earlier, and there's there's been a long-standing debate about whether or not Napoleon had had also seen this text. And some say yes, others say no. And but one of the, the reasons that's that's often cited for why probably he didn't is that he didn't take into account the fact that you know it snows very often. In in Russia. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, very interesting, Tim, in, in the, where he, he seems to relish being in a position of weakness and he, he attacks the idea of being weak. He's, you can turn this round, he says, by, 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 by following my rules. Yes, he, he, he is a good general for, for the underdog mm. and if 
it reflects his historical experience in the state of Wu. Uh, that may be an echo um, of his actual situation because this is a sort of frontier state uh, which uh, is probably not as... Um, if it's... It, it's probably not as heavily populated effectively as the northern states so uh, he has to be very careful in his use of manpower um, and um, his emphasis on not throwing away your your troops uh, um, as an asset uh, does actually work well with with the side that has the least troops um, and of course the elements of surprise and so forth can make up for, for uh, weakness in numbers so uh, yes his whole strategic approach to me does seem to resonate a bit with that of a state that is not got that sort of overwhelming manpower that uh, states in North China were able to feel during the war warring states period um, and uh, his whole way of, of doing battle uh, certainly again to move forward perhaps uh, uh, anticipate some later discussion uh, one can see there are elements in, in that way of thinking that would have appealed to Mao as, as a guerrilla commander um, however um, uh, Sun Tzu's uh, attitude is you've got to uh, finish everything quickly the whole idea of a protracted guerrilla war is totally alien to him Imra, um, when did this text, uh, here's this, this book, become fixed? Bec you you described very, um, very well uh, the um, the good old shrouded in mystery phrase that we often get when we go that far back. Um, but when did it become fixed to say, well, this is it. This is this is a book that matters, wherever it came from, and it is part of what we follow now. And it, it went through uh, millennia after that. What about what time and how? Well, I think. Again, we're not exactly sure, but we have the first, uh, one of the first commentators was Cao Cao um, from the 3rd century um, um, AD. And he, um, it's, it's thought, or some at least, there's a scholarly consensus that probably he edited to the, uh, the text to some extent. And then uh, from there on, it was, is much more similar than what we have today. So I would say, we have evidence of the text in a nearly, in almost the same form as we have um, today, probably from the second century BC, but from the third century AD, it was even closer uh, to our current um, and so it becomes version. Sorry, excuse me. Yes, it becomes part of Chinese culture a bit. Oh, well, absolutely. And the educa an educated Chinese person, this would be one of the books he or would read. Yes, absolutely. I, presume I was about to say or she, but there wouldn't be a she, would there? Really? No. Well, it could possibly really? be a she. Yes, uh -huh. yes. I mean, this text was not only read by people, um, by generals or people mm. engaged in war, but it, it was a strategical text. It was mm. about thinking in certain situations so it could have been read by a woman as well yeah. two of the commentators were poets i mean best known for their poetry rather than their military thought so this is something that spans uh, all kinds of uh, aspects of literate society because yeah. along the way it had commentaries added to it all the time all the time to make it relevant to the time and to clear it up because there's rather ambivalent text uh, at the beginning as i understand I find it ambivalent, but... but well, if you uh, find it ambivalent, the rest of us are lost. No, Imre perhaps is... Uh, well, I, I think the, the appeal of the text today, in some ways, I think, goes back to the, to the strategic aspect, and I think that was recognised much earlier. If we look at sort of the earliest catalogues of people who have nothing to do with warfare, they have several versions of this text in their collections, which suggest that they were also using it as sort of a self-help kind of manual, but, mm. but we still... You know, do nowadays. It could be anything from managing your family to managing a business, uh, nowadays accounting. Uh, it could be uh, how you read, how you do literature, how you, you engage in the what arts. What did they get out of it in terms of how you read literature and how you... So they got the art of war. We've mm -hmm. been talking exclusively deception. If, you, if you're organizing your household, what do you get out of this book? It helps you think about how, as uh, Emery also suggested, about certain challenges 
about situations that you need to analyze. You should not go for a universal answer as to how you manage your family. There may be values within a family setting, but you have servants, you have uh, all sorts of uh, other members of the family, and deciding what the best answer might be could involve strategizing about the situation. Mm -hmm. And also we shouldn't forget that um, many of the literati uh, were actually holding office, so they had a political career. And so if you had a political career, obviously strategic thinking was important, mm -hmm. how to move ahead, how t first of all, how to do your job, but also how to promote your own career. So that was important. How did the art of war start to travel outside China? Well, I think the earliest um, example of a translation of the art of war uh, comes from the Tangut um, state, which was um, sort of in the from the 11th century until about uh, 1227 when the the Mongols crushed them. So this was a state. Um, somewhere in northern China and in Mongolia, and they translated the um, the art of war, and not only the art of war, but also other military texts into their own language and wrote it down with their own script. Even before this, we have evidence of the art of war traveling to Japan, uh, to Korea, to the kingdom of Pekche, and also to Japan. So this would have been from even the 7th, 8th century. Mm. Let's just stay with Japan because people know quite a lot about Japan, or a lot about <laughs> Japan. So what did you do in Japan? It would seem to be a rather different society, a society mm. of samurai, individual heroes and so on. You're aching to get in, I can see that. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a big fan of Kurosawa's um, <laughs> film Kagemusha, uh, which is about uh, a warlord who uses a double, to, or his, his uh, family does, to conceal the fact that he's been killed by a sniper. Now that particular warlord is a historical uh, figure, uh, Takeda Shingen. He he carried a banner with with four Chinese characters on, which are straight out of the Sunza, and this is historical. And um, and the the characters were wind, forest, fire, mountain. Um, when you said that, what was he meaning? What's the okay, well, in the original Sunza context, you, you you've got to sort of. Uh, strike like a wind, be as tranquil as a forest, be as devastating as a fire, and as firm as a mountain. What does this mean about the... When you're talking about impact on Japan, did it change the way means, Japan read, okay. run their army or fought or what? It means they run their strategy that way. Uh, but in fact, um, I think the problem is that, that, that although they run their strategy that way, uh, the... Uh, armies are organized still along a slightly heroic model with the uh, with the warlords the uh, and, and the samurai class at the top um, and uh, this uh, has persisted uh, in the sense that when uh, in the 20th century with the onset of imperialism um, there has been in, was in Japan a certain hearkening back to the samurai ethos. So there is a concept of heroism, which actually, uh, at the time of the revival, was sparked as much by Victorian ideals of uh, wholesome manliness as any traditional ideals, because Britain was at that point the successful imperial wholesome power. Wholesomely manly society. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the whole approach to militarism in Japan is not quite Chinese in the sense that, that uh, uh, there is there is a strong sense of a warrior elite still that's that's been revived whereas the idea of a war warrior elite is very foreign to Sun Tzu. Can we take it can we let it march through time now can we talk about Asia it's moved move to Asia and then to Europe Hilda? Yes. Um, this book Indeed. It uh, came up slightly later, the translation of uh, Swinza than some other Chinese classical text. Uh, the first translation that we know of is a French translation by Joseph Amiot in 1772. He was a Jesuit at the court of uh, the ruling uh, Qing uh, emperor. He'd been there for a while. And what was interesting, he didn't come up with this idea by himself. He uh, kept up a uh, very frequent uh, correspondence with uh, the then 
Minister of Finance or the equivalent uh, of that under uh, Louis Louis XV, Louis the Fifteenth, uh, and he asked him whether he could inform him better about the military situation in Qing China, and. Uh, Joseph Amio decided that this was a good opportunity to translate not just the Swinza but all sorts of other military classics and at the same time he also included uh, plates of what the army actually looked like at the time. And you goes through, um, we're near the end of the program now Jim, but uh, you mentioned Mao earlier, yes. Mao Zedong, and he is supposed to have taken note he of this. He certainly quotes the Swinza. Yes, and do you think he quoted it to show that he knew it or quoted it because he was acting on it? A bit of both. I, I think that uh, he uh, he had a certain level of classical education, the, the sort of key texts of the heritage, and uh, of course it, it helped uh, to to demonstrate that. But at the same time, there are elements in, in the Sunza that, that he would have been familiar with and he would have... Uh, what elements? Uh, well, the the whole idea of keeping the enemy guessing, the idea of the of of making sure that the enemy is surprised, uh, the whole uh, idea of outthinking the enemy. Then, in a hundred battles, you will uh, never be defeated. Know your enemy. Know yourself. Finally, Imre, what status has the art of war today? Well, it's still one of the most important and most revered classical Chinese text, something a text that everybody would know about in China and obviously also in the West. So uh, just to give you um, sort of an example how how much publications are happening about the Sunzi, just in 2015 there were 240 books published um, in China and in Japan and partly in the West about the Sunzi, and these include a, a certain number of um, scholarly, scholarly academic publications, but also uh, books about Sunzi and the and Mao, and Sunzi and management, Sunzi and uh, the ma- um, all, all sorts of things. And so, so it's it's very much alive, and it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Emery Galamas. Thank you, Tim Barrett. Thank you, Hilda de Bitt. Next week, we'll be discussing the Highland Clearances, which followed the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Is scholarship continuing about the a more precise um, view of the origin? Oh, absolutely. Of this? Yes. And how, far, how are you going? Because you're still you're still very tentative about it. Well, it's not me. <laughs> I, I think it's. <laughs> I, 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 I do. I'm the representative <laughs> of the whole field, whole world of Chinese scholarship, sir. Well, no, it's 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 not just the Sunzi, and it's just not not just me. But with um, when we have these attributions to the past. Um, we don't know. I mean, we can only go by. We can only say for certain if we have evidence, right? Mm. We have material evidence, and these are archaeological texts. Or sometimes we find other texts which might quote this text. Um, so it's scholarship is going on actually. Yeah. So it's it's um, there are new and new um, findings. People um, come up with new theories. So what about the Chinese today? Are they taking a lot of notice of it? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's yeah. If you walk into a bookstore, you're yes. going to find as many uh, editions as you would find. In, uh, but are the any Chinese English high command or? taking uh, notice of it? Are they saying we must follow some of these That's ideas? A good question. I mean, they, they certainly are citing a lot of other texts. I'm, I'm not sure that they f- particularly focus on this one. They have been going back to some, some other I ones. Uh, Jim Guan Gong, the th- Menchus, Guan Oh, uh, yes, a lot of that those, is... Uh, is but I think the underlying idea that uh, can be traced back to the Sunza whenever that emerges, that of um, an intellectual approach to warfare, to have a, an intellectual uh, class that is comfortable with the use of violence, um, has persisted right the way through Chinese history.
the rhetoric, of course, may be of you know the higher moral higher ground is always seized by by those who wish to uh, discomfort their enemies. But uh, the actual practice tends to be somewhat more along the lines of Sun Tzu, uh, and certainly there is in Sun Tzu a sort of validation of the use of violence, which means that um, with the formation of the modern Chinese state. In response to imperialist incursions by nations of whom the, the British were the most notable, there has been an emphasis on not on a military elite, but mm -hmm. on what one could call a martial awareness throughout the whole population. And, and that would be something that would then extend into even the lower levels of education, uh, not just Boy Scouts, but real sense that uh, from an early age people should understand military matters. And what I find interesting about China, which I don't vi visit very often, but is the extent to which there is public discourse about modes of warfare that mm. you know what are our weapons what are our opponents weapons that's on the television in a way you don't find in any western society that but I, I would know. say the, the core leadership to my knowledge brings it up far less and I think m that may have to do with the fact that sort of the core values now are harmony and, and so the sorts of things that may not be the core characteristics of, of this particular text but it certainly is, is there but I think it's, it's there for uh, different uh, audiences and it's being used um, does this does this make the Chinese attitude to war different from the American the British and so on you mean today yeah is it an influence on the Chinese attitude to no, war? I, I think actually the Sun Tzu is very much in the minds of present-day Chinese it's mm -hmm. a very short text mm -hmm. and everybody knows it everybody probably would have had read it there's a very strong tradition of seeing and thinking about these texts through literature. So there are all these martial novels uh, going back actually centuries before, but many new ones. And so people think about this and, and it becomes kind of part of the part of everyday culture, popular yeah. culture. In Japan as well, that is part partially the case yeah. that uh, it, when it gets adopted, it's also adopted in military novels and theater. So a lot of these texts are sort of being adapted to popular cultural genres. And in that way, people absorb it too. They may not have read the text, but they will have sort of absorbed the language mm -hmm. <laughs> from other media. And so they also occur in movies today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so probably in, to a different extent than how warfare would occur in movies in the West. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that. It but it's part of a sort of general thing. education in a way that it isn't in the West, is what you're saying. Well, one of the things that surprised me, I, I taught in Tennessee for a while, and you have uh, military uh, students in military training take those courses as well. They were also reading that text, and they were also telling me that, that it, in, in West Point <laughs> as hoping, well. I was trying to get you to say that. <laughs> no response. So you, you, he says you, you were teaching, and these and a, young yeah. military students yeah. were coming and bringing the art of war yeah. with them. And, uh, yeah, and making the point that at West Point, that's, this yeah. is on the curriculum. And uh, and I, I think it, it was in the French uh, military circles as well. Immediately after it appeared, it got rave reviews from keep military personnel. The 19th century was more difficult because that was a time when China was losing battles and, so they, mm. and they forgot about it for a while. But then it came back again in the, in the 20th century and I think now it is it is a classic in many military academies. Now that they're winning. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> again. Uh, well, the century of shame indeed. has passed. I hope you yeah. enjoyed it. No, thank you very much. Thank you. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Hello, I'm Kirsty Young, presenter of Desert Island Discs. Each week, I ask some of the world's most outstanding and impressive people to reflect on their life as they contemplate being cast away to a desert island. All they're allowed to choose is eight discs, a book and a luxury item. You can subscribe to Desert Island Discs from wherever you get your podcasts and download them at your leisure. And in addition, you can also listen to many of the 3,000 extraordinary people who've been cast away to our island over the years. That's the Desert Island Discs podcast. I do hope you'll join us.